Aside from that, today's homework was flashcards for chapter seven and eight. Uh, tomorrow will be flashcards for chapters nine and 10. Friday, um, peer responses to your threaded discussion. Um, I did grade the first threaded discussions um, and I try to get in there and respond to each and every one of you. Um, so uh, a couple things that I saw when I was grading is just want to remind you to use research in your initial post, at least. That doesn't mean that you can't use research in subsequent posts, and that would be amazing. We should get to a point where we're doing that, and it's not just opinion, right? Because the whole field of science uh, and medicine is based on research um, and our best practices. So, um, but for here, at least that initial post needs to show evidence of research. So that, so while you can use websites, websites really aren't the best um, resource, right? They're not peer reviewed. They haven't been looked at by other experts in the field. Any nut job can put anything that they want on the internet and call it like fact. So I would prefer that you're using your textbooks, you're using the library, that would be really amazing. If you are um, putting a reference and you find that it doesn't have an author that you can list and it doesn't have a publication date, that's probably two pretty good signs that it is not a good source of research search for you, okay? So the, um, the other part of that is remember, uh, you need a reference and an in-text citation. For that as well. So put that in text citation um, next to that information that you found at that source. If you found some sort of statistic, then cite it there. Okay. Um, working through the first deliverable for the experiment. Um, I don't think I'm quite halfway through. Um, I was working on them this morning. My proposal to you is if you are not happy with your grade, you can do a regrade. Uh, you can submit that by Friday, close of business, and I will regrade those and average the two grades for you if you wish to get a better grade. Um, so having said that, um, I posted that in the announcement as well. So um, by Friday sometime, if you wanna get that revised and get it in, um, I'll regrade it for you, okay? Um, if there happen to be some of you where I'm like, um, I really don't see how this connects to micro, then you're going to have to choose something else. Or you're going to have to show me how that relates. If you're doing something about tying your shoes, and that's your experiment, I need to know how tying your shoes relates to one of the course objectives. Where can you find the course objectives? Who knows? In the syllabus, thank you, Tori. Yep, in the syllabus, kind of down near the end of the syllabus, there's a whole list of course objectives. If you can't, if you can't tie, <laughs> uh, tying your shoes to one of those course objectives, then it's probably not a viable experiment in this context. Okay, so um, if I give you feedback that says I'm kind of having a hard time making the connection, either make it for me or pick a different topic. Those would be the two um, options, okay? I will get the rest of those finished graded today if I have to stay up till midnight. That way you guys have a few days to get it turned around. Um, so I will finish those up today, come heck or high water. Um, I think everything else is up to date. Um, and then I'll try to get in there to the threaded discussions uh, for week two and make some comments and read your posts, okay? Questions about any of that? All right, guys, how are you holding up? We've been through a month and a half of micro already, right? No, that was a joke. I, I hardly even got a smile. Okay, um, more coffee. That's always my answer, more coffee. Until you can like see noises, it's my suggestion. Okay. Uh, so, no questions to review for the post-test. Um, I have some videos for us about bacteria sex. Yeah, 
I do. And uh, so there's three different ways, right? Bacteria transfer information from one to another. And that's um, through um, conjugation, uh, transduction, right? And transformation. Those are the three ways. And uh, then the book also goes over um, lysogenic and lytic cycles, but that has specifically to do with one of those three. So each of the videos is just a minute to two minutes long. I think one is like four minutes, but it will give us like just another brief overview, hopefully some images, bring it a little bit to life from the text, because I don't know about you in the text, I can't really visualize like what is going on in those processes. I tried to put some pictures in the um, lecture. Um, so we'll watch those. I'll ask, answer any questions that you have or any, uh, give any clarifications that you need. And then we're going to do a little um, breakout project about mutagens, um, ones that we find commonly in the OR. So we'll do that. And our goal is to be done by 9.50 so we can take a 10 minute break before we start our lab. Okay? Are you guys up for it? Yeah. Okay, hang in there. Sometimes they say, you know, like my mom would always say, if you're not feeling well, like dress up, put your makeup on and put your lipstick on. And like, sometimes that helps. Um, I'm not sure. My watch thinks that I need to breathe right now. And I feel like I'm breathing, but doesn't think I am. Okay, here we go. We're gonna watch some videos. Um, let's see, meeny, meeny, my mall. That's not what I wanted to show you. Okay, I'm gonna try again, two times the charm. This is my email, okay, this is my calendar. This is the video, okay. Let me get the chat box up here just in case so I can see what you have to say. Okay, here we go. And this is about bacterial conjugation. You're going to conjugate. Conjugate? Isn't that what you do when you get? Never mind. Okay. Here we bacterial go. conjugation is a process of genetic transfer between bacterial cells that requires direct contact between the cells. Many, but not all, species of bacteria can conjugate. Conjugation can occur between cells of the same species or even between cells of two different species. Mm -hmm. A small DNA circle or plasmid called the F factor is required for conjugation. The F factor stands for fertility factor. Strains of bacteria containing uh -huh. the F factor are called F plus. Those without it are called F minus. An F plus mm -hmm. cell or donor produces a structure called a pilus to connect with another recipient cell. Begin conjugation, the F factor is cut at a specific region called the origin of transfer by a protein assembly called the relaxosome, which associates with a strand to be transferred, or the tDNA strand. Accessory proteins of the relaxosome are released, but a portion of the relaxosome called the relaxase remains attached to the tDNA. This tDNA relaxase complex is recognized by a coupling factor and transferred to the exporter, a complex in the F plus cell that is contiguous with the pilus. The exporter pumps the tDNA relaxase complex into the recipient cell. Once the entire tDNA molecule is transferred to the recipient cell, relaxase joins the ends to make a circular DNA molecule. As the tDNA is transferred to the recipient cell, it is replicated to become double-stranded. In the donor cell, the F factor DNA was also replicated to become double stranded. This actually occurred as the tDNA was being transferred to the recipient cell. In the end, both cells wind up with a complete double stranded copy of the F factor. Their connection through the pilus is released, and each is now an F plus cell that can go on to conjugate with other cells. Sounds promiscuous. Okay, whatever that is, we don't know. Okay, so um, before I play the next one about transduction, I just want to say that 
one of the biggest takeaways for conjugation should be that there has to be direct contact. Like two bacteria have to directly contact each other. That's what one of the major things, in, in uh, my opinion, that sets apart conjugation from the other ways that genetic information is transferred. So if you want kind of an overall takeaway, that's the biggest one, I would say. Okay, questions about that so far? We don't have to really know about tDNA and, and relaxases, but it is, in, you know, just to get the gist of that, you know, we're transferring genetic information and um, the cells have to be in contact with each other. Okay, this is one about uh, transduction. And um, after this one, we're gonna watch another one that's about the lytic and lysogenic cycles, which has to do specifically with uh, transduction. Okay, okay, so here we go with this one. Let me turn the little notes on. In generalized transduction, a segment of DNA is carried from one bacterial cell to another by a bacterial virus called a bacteriophage or phage. The phage attaches to the bacterial cell and injects its nucleic acid into the host cell. A phage enzyme is produced that breaks down the host DNA into smaller fragments. Phage DNA is replicated and phage coat proteins are produced. During formation of the mature phage particles, a few phage heads may surround fragments of bacterial DNA instead of phage DNA. The phage particle carrying the bacterial DNA infects another cell, transferring the bacterial DNA to the new cell. When the bacterial DNA is introduced into the new host cell, it can become integrated into the bacterial chromosome, thereby transferring genes to the recipient. This cell then multiplies and carries new genetic material. That blows my mind. I don't know why. It just gives you that visual of how bacteria can change like so easily and so quickly because those, those bacteriophages are replicating so quickly that um, this is just an accidental thing that happens, right? And then uh, some, you know, genetic information from that bacteria gets transferred to another species. And uh, then it becomes different. It could become resistant, right? It could um, help it to survive or perhaps it could hinder it, right? All right, so big takeaway here. Transduction is only to do with bacteriophages. Big takeaway. Okay, so let's watch the um, lytic and lysogenic video next. Oh man, no, I don't want to do a poll. Boy, this whole thing here makes me crazy. How do I get rid of the poll? Oh, okay, never mind. Got it. Okay, lytic and lysogenic. So this is still having to do with transduction. Hey guys, how are you doing? This is a uh, video to show you the difference between the lytic and lysogenic cycles uh, of how bacteriophages can reproduce. Um, just remember that this process, or both these processes, have only to do with bacteriophages, which is viruses that attack bacteria. Um, it doesn't happen in animal viruses like the flu and other things. So basically, um, to kind of give you a sense of what's going on here. We see that here we have a bacteria. So this is the bacteria right here, and this is the chromosome of the bacteria, and this would be a bacteriophage. This is the virus that attacks the bacteria. So if we kind of see what's gonna go on here, um, this particular virus is going to, as you can see, inject its DNA um, into the actual bacteria. And so now this bacteria has its own DNA and it has the DNA from the actual uh, bacteria. And so if we see what happens from this point on, we'll now see that the host DNA has been destroyed. The base of the phage DNA, the genes of the phage DNA directed the host DNA to 
fall apart. And so now the only DNA that's left in the actual bacteria is the DNA from the virus. And I'm sure you can figure out what's going to happen from this point on. Um, now, of course, the, the ribosomes of the bacteria are going to be uh, producing proteins. These proteins are viral proteins. And as you can tell here, um, the phage DNA is going to now code for the production of more viruses. And of course, now these viruses are going to at some point um, explode from the cell. And that is basically the lytic cycle. And of course, lytic means to lice or it means to cut or break open. Um, so this results in the destruction of the bacteria. And that is basically the lytic cycle. So now we're going to go through the lysogenic cycle. So now this is the lysogenic cycle, and this uh, differs in a couple ways, and I'll talk about them after. Um, so the first part of this is the same, that basically a virus is going to attack the bacteria. And so what they didn't show here is that the virus would have landed here, would have incorporated its DNA exactly the same as it did in the lytic cycle. But here's now the difference. In the lysogenic cycle, we see that instead of the DNA from the virus destroying the host DNA, it actually integrates itself into the chromosome of the host DNA. So now the difference is that, you know, there is no destruction yet. So the beautiful thing for the virus is that, well, basically, you know, it's not going to be making a lot of its babies, for lack of a better word, um, or offspring immediately, but this cell is going to start to divide, and it's going to divide zillions of times. And every time it divides, you can see that little teeny piece of DNA from the phage um, is going to, it's basically referred to as prophage DNA, is going to be carried from generation to generation. So now you have potentially millions, if not hundreds of millions of bacteria that all have this little piece of viral DNA. So at some point, when this host cell um, becomes either um, stressed or exposed to you know, ultraviolet light or some kind of chemicals, a system called phage induction happens. Basically what happens, you'll see here that that little piece of viral DNA pops out, and now, basically, the cell goes through the lytic cycle. So the second half of the lysogenic cycle is basically the lytic cycle. So what's going to happen? It's going to destroy the host DNA. It's going to start making the proteins, and there we go. So the difference between these uh, systems is that in the lysogenic cycle, um, the chromosome or the uh, nuclear DNA material from the virus incorporates into the actual phage DNA. Um, and is carried generation to generation. So the bacteria doesn't make it, or the virus does not make as many offspring as quickly, but it has incorporated its DNA into many, many more cells, and thus giving the ability to potentially make much more offspring over a longer period of time. And so uh, that is basically the difference between the lytic and lysogenic, and I hope you uh, enjoyed it. We did. Okay, man, I gotta get rid of that little, the little thing comes down every time I try to sneak in there. Nope. I don't know how to make it go away. I think it's like control H or something. Okay, um, questions about transduction. Remember transduction just has to do with bacteriophages. The lytic cycle, the bacteriophage is going to insert its genetic material and they're going to immediately multiply and burst out and go skipping about. With the um, lysogenic cycle, it's delayed. All right, it actually gets copied over and over and over until whatever time something happens. And then it starts to divide in zillions of cells instead of just one at a time. Okay, questions about that one before we watch this last one about transformation. Okay. DNA transformation involves the transfer of naked DNA into a recipient cell. In the first step, double-stranded donor DNA binds to specific receptors on the surface of a competent cell. One strand of the donor DNA is degraded by nucleases while the other strand enters the cell. 
The single-stranded donor DNA pairs with an homologous region on the recipient DNA and is integrated into the recipient genome by a breakage and reunion mechanism called homologous recombination. If there are any differences between the nucleotide sequences of the donor and recipient DNAs, the mismatch repair system comes into play. The repair system removes either the donor or the recipient strand and replaces it with the complementary sequence. Since either strand may be repaired, some cells contain the new donor DNA and others have the original DNA sequences. In the laboratory, cells are plated on selective media so that only the transformants will grow. Okay, that is it. Let me come back to you. Okay, so the big takeaway with transformation is that it's naked DNA, it's naked, and it's being inserted into there, okay? Okay, good. Thanks, Tori. Um, these videos, you can also access them in the Blackboard. I posted links to them there as well in today's content. So if you want to watch them again, they're there for you to access. Okay. Questions about this. Are there other things that you want to discuss? before we move to our group activity. So let me ask you guys a question. Um, I was wrestling with this yesterday after I finished recording chapter eight. Um, and chapter eight, of, you know, is all about viruses and it's this type of virus and there's these ones and this type of virus and there's these ones and this type of virus and there's these ones. Um, <laughs> I struggle with getting that content across to you in the lecture that is not boring, that is helpful, that's not going overboard, that's giving you enough information. Um, would just love some of your feedback or constructive criticism regarding how I can make that better without making the PowerPoint lecture another hour in length. I don't need to read the text to you. I get it. Um, did you have ideas or thoughts when you were watching it? Like, oh, if she would have done this, it would have been better. Or if this could happen, I don't know. If you don't have any feedback, that's, you know, great too. But I was just thinking, you know, you guys are a whole bunch of other sets of eyes and brains. And, um, you know, if you have suggestions, I would be more than happy to hear them and take them into consideration. So so I can get better <laughs> and so that I can help you guys. That's my main goal, to help you guys. And if what I'm doing isn't helpful, then I wanna change that. So um, any thoughts? Any alarm bells? No? No help from me whatsoever. I know. Boo. I can I can try to use this as my magic wand. Yeah. And Leviosum. I don't know. Okay. Uh let's Leviosa. It's Leviosa. Okay. All right. Well, um, I try to use images and I thought, well, maybe I'll give an image for each one. And I was like, oh God, you know, there's like so many of those. So um, if you guys think of something, please like, if you have some aha moment, um, let me know if there's something that I can do better. Of course, I'm always open to that and I appreciate it. Okay. Cut, print, take the tape, moving on. Um, okay. So my idea now is for us to do our breakout rooms. Today we'll have five groups and we're gonna be looking at different mutagens that we will be exposed to in the operating room as surgical techs, okay? So um, let me divide the 
groups and then I'll share my screen with the content because I think it'll be a little bit easier than me just verbally. Um, so let me see if I can do the breakout room and then share my screen after that. I'm not sure. Okay, five rooms, that's what we want. Okay, all right, we got my rooms. So here's what I have, and I'll ask for some volunteers to group lead. We can have repeats if you want, um, but if you haven't gone, I would highly encourage you to go. Um, room one, we have Alyssa, Rulan, Sean, and Tammy. Any group leader in there? Don't be afeared. I'll do it. Is that Tammy? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, group two, we have Ivana, Sarah, Talman, and Tori. Who's going to be my leader in there? Thank you, Ivana. All right, group three, we have Ian, Jackie, Rainy, and Wendy. Thank you, Rainy. All right, room four, we have Adriana, Andrea, 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 uh, Ariana, and Hannah. Come on, ladies. I can pick someone. Thank you. All right, and then lastly, we have Alexis, Gabe, Lixie, and Robbie. Gabe, do you want to be the leader in there? Okay, thanks. Okay, here we go. I'm going to share my screen so you guys can see what we're doing. Um, let's see, which one? Oh, let's see, let's do this. Um, let's see. I have too many documents. It's not that one. Hold on one second and I'll bring you back. Okay. All right. Can you guys see this document? It says group ones through fives. It says I'm sharing. Okay, thank you. All right, so group one, you're gonna be looking at ethylene oxide. Group two, you will have polymethyl methacrylate or PMMA. Group three, you have fluoroscopy slash x-ray. Okay, group four, laser plume. Group five, cautery smoke. I don't know if you want to take a snapshot of this screen so that you can remember what the questions are or jot them down, but these are the things that we're going to be looking for. What is it and what is its purpose in the OR? Or what is it caused by, right? I mean, you can't say laser plume, what's its purpose? Um, but why is it there? Why does it ex exist? Okay, laser plume and cautery are going to be like that. Um, type of mutagen, all right, so is it ionizing radiation? Is it a carcinogen? Is it what? What is it? 
manifestations in the body. What does it cause? Does it cause cancer? Does it interrupt DNA? Does it cause a frame shift mutation? Is it a missense mutation? What? Uh, number four, susceptible populations. So maybe you'll find this and maybe you won't. But I just had this thought as I was reading through um, that maybe there are some populations that are at a higher risk when they're exposed to these things. I don't know. See if you can find it. If not, it's not a huge deal. It was just kind of a little side thought. And then the last one is methods of protection. So how do we protect ourselves in the operating room as search checks? Okay. Everybody got that? I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Is there anybody else who needs it up longer before I send you to your groups? Okay, here we go. All right. Um, how long do we think? Do we think 10 minutes is long enough to get this information done? Or we think we need 15, 10? Okay, Ian says 10. All right, here we go. I will call you back in about 10 minutes, okay? Let me know if you need something. I have my phone. Okay, have fun. It's you and me again, Robbie. What room were you in? I can't remember. The last one. I don't know what I just said. <laughs> okay, here you go. Room five. So ETO, as it applies to us, is a... Um, it's chemical sterilant that's converted from a liquid form to a gas. It is, it is touched on on page 87, and it works really well for the surgical instruments that are a little bit more heat sensitive or moisture sensitive. So it, it has that wonderful benefit. However, unfortunately, with that benefit comes the risk of the mutation that it can cause as well um, as far as the exposure. So... It can cause what's called a frame shift mutation. And um, so that can actually lead to manifestation in the body as cancer, liver cancer, prostate cancer, and even bone cancer. We didn't necessarily find um, a specific population that was susceptible to it. It's just kind of a generalized thing as you're exposed and the amount of time and the amount of exposure. Right. So, then also methods of protection are limiting that exposure, but it does talk about the actual either negative pressure in the room or the room aeration limit is necessary. The room actually needs to aerate for a certain amount of time before reoccupation. Yeah, I can remember when I was at the Casa Grande Hospital and we had like a huge ETO sterilizer in there, like back in the day. And um, the, the, sterilization process takes forever. It's like 16 hours or something. And um, sometimes you'd be in there on the weekend, like doing a case and you'd hear the alarm go off and you then you have to open the door. It's like has this big wheel and it's this big metal door and um, you open it and then you just open it a crack. Like that's it because it has to aerate and has to, and that thing creeped me out. Like they had me so afraid of it. They're like, it has to aerate. It's really caustic. You can't just open it a crack and then get out of there. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, that was like <laughs> so frightening. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and we use it all the time to sterilize scopes and um, e-lick evacuators because they're glass and rubber. So anything that's rubber or glass or powder or plastic, um, you know, all of that stuff can be sterilized in there. So yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah, not, not so much used anymore. Thank goodness they have other stuff, but yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Questions about ETO? Yes, 
decide to stay away. Okay. All right. Group two, that's Ivana's group. And you guys had polymethyl methacrylate. Tell us about that. Okay, so it is widely known as plexiglass, but in the OR it is used as bone cement. And it's most commonly used for implant fixation in ortho and trauma cases. We found out that it is a chemical mutagen and can also afford, uh, absorb mutagenic substances. It is considered safe and is rated as low hazard, but it does list concerns that it can be a carcinogen, cause allergic reactions, and organ system toxicity. BMMA is successful to patients who have metal implants that because it can cause corrosion like over time. And then lastly, for protection, we realize that it's just your PPE that you would wear um, in surgery because it is safe enough to put it into the patient's body. So just regular PPE would be our form of protection from it. Okay, very good. Good information there. A couple of things to add um, as far as protecting ourselves. One of the things that we have is um, like a, a vacuum, um, like evacuator. So when you go to mix the cement, what makes it caustic is the fumes that come from mixing this powder with the liquid. And have you ever walked into a nail salon? You know what that smells like? That smells like bone cement. That's what that smells like. And um, it's a lot the same stuff. And so um, it's the fumes that come off from, from that, that chemical reaction. And so the, whatever mixer you're gonna use, cement mixer, um, has like a long tube. And so you're gonna throw that tube off the field and your nurse is going to hook it to this little, um, foot control device and um, it has like a gauge on it. It goes from red to yellow to green. And so you'll step on it as you're mixing and you want to get that needle all the way up to green and you'll mix and it's maybe a minute and a half that you'll mix, but you want to, as you're mixing, you're going to have to keep looking at that petal to make sure that it's in the green because it's going to be taking a lot of those fumes away. You can still definitely smell it, but that is another method that we use to kind of protect ourselves. Um, and then the thing I always like to say for my ladies, if you are in the OR and you are pregnant, you do not want to be in there while they are mixing cement. You don't want to be in there. You don't want to be exposed to it. Um, so if that's the case, then, you know, we need to know so that we can keep you out of there. Okay. Those are the two Two other things that I could think of. Any other questions or comments about that? The chemical reaction that occurs with bone cement is pretty amazing. It's like um, it heats up. It's like epoxy. So when you mix the two together, like you have this finite amount of time before it is like rock solid. So your job as the tech is to get it mixed. Then you have to take it out. You have to load it in the cement gun. Looks like a caulking gun, pretty much. You gotta load it in there. You gotta get it to your team. They've gotta use it, put the implants in, and then um, clean, clean up, right? Because it's like you, you put the stuff on the back of the implant and you put it on the bone and you put it on and then it goes like, it like squishes out like when you're making a waffle or like when I'm making waffles. Um, and so they have to clean that up, right? So you're gonna keep a little piece of cement for yourself and you're just gonna not play with it because as you play with it, it increases that reaction, but you're just gonna put it on your mayo stand. And so that way they can kind of test it to see how close they're getting to it being hard because they want to get everything done that they need to do before it gets hard, right? Because that would be bad news, bad news bears. Okay, very interesting. Polymethyl methacrylate, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep, it's a thing. Okay, good. Group three, that's Rainey's group, and fluoroscopy slash x-ray. Fluoroscopy. So the definition of fluoroscopy and how it's actually used in the OR is that it's an imaging technique that gathers real-time moving images using the fluoroscopy fluoroscope, fluor, fluoroscope of internal structures of patients. It consists of a screen, x-ray beam passing through your body. It mimics an x-ray movie where continuous images display on monitor. So that sounds really cool. So like, you can see the 
stuff in the room. I don't know. But the um, type of mutagen is an is ionizing radiation. And basically what that does is it breaks down your chromosomes, um, and it breaks down ions, it creates free radicals in your body, it makes mistakes in your DNA replication. Um, we did find that it is a much higher chance of health impacts in women than in men, which was kind of interesting. Um, absolutely everybody that's exposed to it is susceptible to this. Um, but they really do contraindicate pregnant women just because of the potential harm that can come to the fetus. And best uh, form of protection so far, anyhow, is lead. Lead, yeah. Um, so time and distance are two big things too, right? So they're not just gonna click on the fluoro and just leave it on indefinitely, right? It's gonna be a couple minutes or it's gonna be a couple seconds rather, um, just a quick peek, right? Whatever the surgeon needs and an x-ray tech will be in there to, to do that. We, it's out of our scope to actually run any type of x-ray thing. Although um, in a lot of departments, you'll find like a mini C-arm, like the regular C-arm is this gigantic thing, right? It has a big like monitor system that, you know, they bring along and it's this big C-shaped thing. Um, but in surgery, uh, sometimes in the department, we have what's a, called a mini C-arm and it's just a little tiny baby one, you know, just like about that big. And, um, and so we use that in there. And um, they say you don't need lead with that. That's what they say. That puts off minimal amounts. But you know, for hands and feet, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Otherwise, we have to call x-ray and get them down there to do it. But but time, distance, and shielding, those are the three big things with ionizing radiation. Time, shielding, and distance. Um, and uh, what was the other thing I was gonna say? Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess that's it. For as far as um, um, the lead, did you read anything about like, is there just one piece? Is there multiple pieces? Do we have to cover? What, what do we have to cover? Um, well, definitely reproductive organs for men and women. They have them specifically for your thyroid. Um, you know, you can have like kind of the full body. You can just have a lower portion. So there's definitely different aprons. If you uh, are they called the aprons for mm -hmm. different parts to protect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably the ones you'll see in the OR most often are the ones that go from like, they just strap over your shoulders and they go like down to your knees or like mid thigh and you'll wear those and then they'll have the thyroid shields. But there are also, um, there's also special eye protection that you can wear and some surgeons wear. Um, some surgeons are really persnickety about it. Others could care less. Um, and then there's also lead gloves, like sterile lead gloves. And one surgeon that I worked with was this, that was his thing. Like he had to have sterile lead gloves if he was working with fluoroscopy because your hands are right under there, right? Especially let's say that we're working on a wrist and you're using fluoro and you're manipulating it and turning it this way and turning it that way, um, your hands are gonna be in there. So that was his thing. Um, for anesthesia, they also have like these lead, um, like movable walls like a little part of a wall, probably as big as like a doorway, a normal doorway on wheels. Um, so you, they can put that up in front of anesthesia and it shields them so they don't have to wear a shield. Um, and then sometimes, and I thought it was just at our hospital, so this is kind of weird. Um, one thing that we would do for um, like cholangiograms is we would take one of those, but like just lived there. Um, a lead gown, a lead apron, and uh, we would take an IV pole and lower it all the way down so it was about like chest level. And there was one of those aprons hanging on it. And then what the surge tech would do was take a male stand cover and drape over it so that it would be sterile. And then the surgeon can just pull that over and put it in front of them and stand behind it and doesn't have to wear a lead apron. Once you've worn a lead apron, you will know why you don't wanna wear a lead apron. It sucks. 
it pulls on your shoulders, it kills your back, it's hot, you sweat like a dog, and Dr. So-and-so just wore it yesterday and sweat like a dog in it. So I don't know what they're doing now, like as far as cleaning them, I don't know if COVID has kind of changed all of that, but like there's just a rack and it's hanging up and you just go grab one and you don't know, like, is it clean? Who wore it? Who sweated in it the last time? Like, you know, you just put it on. Um, so that's kind of gross. Um, but one trick that I would suggest, so stick this back in the back of your head. So when you get out there and you're doing spines and you have to wear lead for six hours, um, when you put it on, get some tape. They have like cloth tape. It's about four inch cloth tape. And um, what you want to do is once you get your lead gown on, like take that tape and raise your shoulders as high as you can and then put that tape around your waist, like pretty snug a couple times. And then when you relax, that shifts the weight like to your hips for the lead gown and not pulling down on your shoulders here. And it really does help if you have to wear it like for a long time. It really does help if you're only going to have it on for an hour. So it's probably not a big deal. But if you're in a lot of spine cases, um, they, uh, that's a good trick if they don't have the ones that are like the skirt and the shirt ones. So that's my thoughts on ionizing radiation. Time, distance, shielding. Okay, questions about that? You don't want to get mutated. Okay, because it might not be in a good way. It's not worth the risk. All right, um, next, Adriana's group had laser plume. Tell us about that. Um, okay, so lasers are used during surgery to coagulate and cut tissue, and the smoke that's produced from uh, the laser is called laser plume, and it's a biological mutagen. Um, its manifestation in the body is it can contain viable particles that can be inhaled, and it can also cause laryngeal HPV. Uh, hydrogen cyanide is also produced. It's a toxic colorless gas that can be absorbed into the lungs through the skin and the GI tract. Um, and the excessive exposure to hydrogen cyanide can cause cardiac arrhythmias, dyspnea, coma, and even death, while chronic low-level exposure can result in neurological effects such as headache, vertigo, nausea, and vomiting, and it's also a carcinogen. Um, susceptible populations are just anyone in the OR who is exposed who's not wearing the proper P PPE during laser procedures. Um, and then methods of protection, we found respirators, eye protectors, and gloves. Um, respirators should not be used as a substitute for an air exhaust, so you should use like an N95 or an N100 mask. And then also central wall room suction units with inline filters are also used. Yep, for sure. And sometimes those are mobile, like those aren't built into the OR suite, like you bring in this machine and it, you know, it does the job. So yeah. Yep, I think you pretty much covered it. Good job. Questions about laser? Laser plume? Don't want to get HPV in your larynx. Doesn't sound like a fun time. Okay, protect yourself. Um, good. And lastly, Gabe, what did you guys find out about cautery smoke? Are you here? Yes, I see you. Um, okay, so for cautery smoke, it's just the, the smoke produced by like um, lasers or electrosurgical devices. Um, and for the, sorry, one second. For the type of mutagen, all we really talked about was that it's a chemical frame shift. And it works by counterbalancing uh, two strands of DNA. I think, right, that's 
Alexis, that's what you said, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, and as far as for who's susceptible, pretty much everyone in the OR, but I feel like the two most susceptible would be the SD and the surgeon, just because we're working directly above where the smoke is coming from. And as far as methods of protection, just basic PPE. And one thing that I kept seeing is um, that they really want you to like know what, like how this, the smoke works, what effects it has on you and just being educated on it, knowing what it is. And yeah. It's biological, right? Is there a yeah. category? biological yeah um the other thing that i would add to that thanks gabe um is suctioning the smoke like you know if the surgeon is using a lot of cautery if you can get the smoke in there if you can get the suction in there to suction some of that smoke that's coming off from the bovie that's a good thing you want to do that but you i've seen some surge techs that are like so crazy about suctioning <laughs> the smoke, uh, you don't want to get in your surgeon's way. I mean, I understand that we want to kind of clear that from the field. I'm not sure if suctioning it does that much besides it kind of displaces it. You know, I mean, it goes into the suction canister, but then where does it go after that? Probably leaks out into the room. I don't know. There's no, you know, like special filters for smoke on the regular suction evacuators. Um, but, you know, you don't want to do it if you're going to be in your surgeon's way. All right. That's my only, that's my only thing, you know, and if you're doing something that needs to facilitate the procedure, then you need to stop suctioning smoke and do something else. You know, you don't want to make that your be all end all, which my, my preceptor, that was like one of her be all end alls. And that's how she got her finger like sawed open by a power saw. So, just, you know, be careful if you're kind of down there in the fray um, with it. That would be my only suggestion. Okay. It's a dangerous place, the OR. I know, right, Tori? It was crazy. I was a student. We were doing an amputation. Um, I think it was above the knee amputation. And so he had the big saw to saw the femur. Anyways, uh, the end of the story is I had to finish that case by myself as a student while she left to go to employee health and the ER or whatever to get her finger stitched up. <laughs> no, not her amputations. Thank God it didn't get amputated. It just like, you know, she pulled it away quickly, but the, I don't know if you've ever tried to saw into something, but it has a tendency to skive off, right? And bone is really hard. And so the surgeon was just starting and was putting some downward pressure and the thing skived off the bone and she was there holding the suction and it just went, you know, right through her finger. And uh, yeah, so she left and I had to finish the case by myself, which was kind of scary, but the surgeon was okay. I mean, he knew he, she had to leave. <laughs> so it wasn't like, it was kind of nice to me, but um, yeah. So just be really careful. I, I, it doesn't seem to make sense that they don't see your fingers, but they don't see your fingers. Like they're really focused on what they're doing. So you have to put your protection first, you know, in your own hands. So, all right. That was some good detective work. Any questions or comments about any of the other material or anything that we've talked about thus far before I give you a break? Okay, kids. Um, it looks like it's about 10 after. So how about we take 10 minutes, we'll come back at 20 after and then we will start our lab portion, okay? Okay, I'll see you in 10. Um, very interesting. Yes. 
All right. Uh, we are going to finish our last principles. So now starts the lab portion. If you would like to um, take notes on this portion for your lab upload, that would be great. I'm gonna share my screen with you. Um, and we've already talked about these. So I'm just gonna give a quick another shout out to these and then we're gonna look at some pictures and see if we can determine if there's any like violations according to the principles that we have talked about in uh, all of the concepts in principle one. Okay, so um, the, these are our, um, let's see, maybe I'm lying to you. Oh yeah, no, we still have stuff from principle one. Sorry, I thought we were finishing up, but that's okay. The pictures I have, um, we've covered those things. So we're gonna look at um, a top of a sterile, um, top of a sterile drape table is the only portion that is considered sterile. We've talked about that before. Any item extending or falling below its edge is considered non-sterile. Again, something we've talked about already. And then the third one, once sterile drapes have been placed, they should not be repositioned. Right, and this goes for anything and everything, whether it's on the mayo stand, the back table, on the patient, whatever the case may be. Okay, so um, back to that first one here, that first little dot at the top, we talked about how um, when you drape something, only the top is sterile. It's the same for the patient as well. Once we put that sterile drape over the patient, where it falls down in a way, that is getting into a dicey area. Now, I would say maybe a couple inches. You know, our patients aren't flat like the mannequin in the lab. They're kind of round and mostly fluffy. And um, so they're going to create like a little mountain. <laughs> and, um, you know, you want to think of not going down any lower than where they're touching the OR table for sure. Um, so if something slides down below that, then we definitely want to say, uh -uh. but if you're taking a test, the very top of that patient, that very top level surface or table or whatever the case may be, is the only part that's considered sterile, okay? Uh, the second one, any item extending or falling below the table is considered non-sterile. Now, what if you have an item that you opened onto the table and it's like a rigid item like this pin, let's say, and it is extending past the edge of the table, but it's not hanging down. Is that okay? What do you guys think? Does this make sense what I'm asking? Didn't you say that like anything kind of, it needs to be within an inch of the edge of the table to be considered sterile? So if it's beyond that inch, is it not sterile? Good question. I would say um, my favorite principle, which we haven't talked about yet, when in doubt, throw it out, right? If, we, if um, in the lab, I always say like, if, if uh, one of you guys has to stop and question me of whether is that sterile or not? If you're questioning it, get rid of it. But I'm gonna tell you that in the OR, if there is a situation like that, we are not gonna remove it, we are gonna leave it, and we're gonna use it, right? Because that one inch margin is kind of like our fail safe, right? But if it's not hanging down, then we're probably gonna leave it in the real world. But in here, where we're applying our best principles, we would probably replace it. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 that's always a good one. Um, the examples given here are suction tubing, a cord, something that's like draping over the edge for sure, for sure. Uh, we wanna get rid of that. <clears throat> um, and then the last one, once sterile drapes have been placed, they should not be repositioned. And we talked about that already and the reasons why. So do we have questions about any of these three concepts? No questions? Comments? All right, let me see if um, I can switch here to... Okay, hold on one second, gotta switch it over. 
this long way. Okay, so here I have some features that I scrounged up. I, I was surprised on how hard it was to find images where there were things going wrong. I, I'm like a Google searching bad surgical setups um, and there's not a lot. So I have a couple of my own that we'll look at as well. So if we're being like nitpick in this setup to the bone, what do you guys see going on in here that would be against those principles that we've already talked about? Or does it look okay? The suture bag looks a little dicey. It's hanging over the edge, right? So the suture bag is actually okay. The suture bag is okay. Um, that is one place that we put it. I know this is crazy, but we can reach inside of it, right? So we don't want to reach down along the front of it, but we can open it and place things inside of it. And it does hang on an edge. Um, honestly, I don't like mine there. Um, just because, uh, Ian, of what you're saying, like it feels weird in your gut to put it there. I usually put it on the back of my mayo stand because I'm, that's where I stand. And that's where, if I'm working, um, that's where I want to be able to put my trash because it's easily accessible so that I can just, you know, little scraps of suture and everything, you know, put it in there. Um, but yes, it is kind of one of those really weird things. Yes, because it's sterile inside and it's not the outside of it. That's how we get away with this. And, and two, like you want to open the top of it and you just kind of want to put your stuff in. You don't want to go all the way down. And the reason why is because we, we don't want to work outside of our zone, right? Nipples to navel, we said, is kind of like our space. And so we don't really want to reach too down, too far down below that either. Yeah, I'm glad you guys picked up on that. That's kind of a weird thing. There's some other weird things we'll talk about as we go through here. I'm sure you guys will pick up on. Mm, what else? What else do your eyes see in here? Oh, the yellow cord. Yeah, that, that doesn't look good, does it, Ruan? This yellow cord kind of looks too close for comfort, hey? Yeah, how far are we supposed to be away from non-sterile stuff? 12 to 18. 12 to 18 inches, right? Yep. And, uh, and you, you can see over here the mayo stand too, right? It looks like it's super close to this back table as well. Probably not that 12 to 18 inches of space that we're needing. Yeah, the suction is really close, right? We're talking about that one inch margin again. There's things kind of put all the way to the edge. We really wanna avoid that if we can, right? Gravity is turned up in the OR. If it can jump or fall off a surface, it will. Trust me, it will. Let me see what Tori says. She doesn't like how the instruments are stacked. Oh, like these guys here and then these guys over here. Yeah, yeah, um, we do do this sometimes. Um, yeah, but I can, I can understand why you're saying that, especially these right here. I, I refer to this as marrying. Um, if you need the one on the bottom, this, or this one can get hung in the other one. So if they're exactly the same and they'll fit on top of each other nicely, I don't think that's a big, too, uh, as big of a deal but if you have like four steps like these guys right here and you're fitting one inside of the other that's just not efficient work it, it, it's not breaking any type of technique but it's not very uh, a very efficient way to work so yeah yep no I like it it does kind of look disorganized and a little bit messy too mm-hmm mm -hmm. Anything else that you see that might be breaking a principle? I think you guys pretty much caught the things that I was looking at. Let's look at another one. This one is, what do you guys think?
the cords again that are hanging over it. Cords are too close. Yep, definitely too close to the wall. I get you. We're not in our 12 to 18 inches away from the wall. It actually kind of looks like um, on the right side, it looks like uh, some of those towels are hanging over. It does, doesn't it? Does it like right here look like this yeah. is hanging over? Yeah. yeah. So I think this is the glove package that is draped over the edge. That's bad. That, that's not a good situation. And it looks like they're too close to the edge. Let me see bulb syringe. Bulb syringe could be touching the wall. Yeah, look, it looks like it's right up against the wall. If not, it's definitely too close for comfort. It also kind of looks like whatever that stand or blue thing is on the far left looks like it's actually pressed up against the table. Let me see. Oh, right here? Yeah. Yeah, that's the mayo stand. That's the mayo stand. And this is not a good situation because we have, the mayo stand's a little bit different of an animal, but this is not really a good situation because we have two really different levels and now you're gonna move away and th this is not gonna, this isn't considered good sterile technique here, but if you also had like um, a ring stand, and most of the time ring stands are shorter than the back table. And if you push them together, again, you have this weird height thing where the, the basin is gonna end up touching the back table cover that's hanging down right? That we said if it, if once it hangs down, it's not sterile anymore. So even though the two things are draped with sterile cloths, you want to be careful of putting them too, in, too close together. Yep. I like it. Good call. Anything else going on here as far as sterility? I think that's pretty much it. Um, let's see, let's look at this one. Okay, this is the mayo stand. And I just grabbed this one from the internet, but I was wondering if you guys saw anything here that looked fishy. The uh, handle on the uh, scissors, again, are uh, hanging off the edge. They're hanging off, right? So here's the, here's the curve ball for you guys. With the mayo stand, the mayo stand is sterile all the way around and underneath. So when things hang off the mayo stand, we're not as concerned because you put like this um, like plastic pillowcase on your mayo stand. And so that allows the top of it and all the underneath of it to be sterile because you're bringing that over your um, patient, right? Over the OR table. Um, so while it could fall off onto the floor, it's actually not considered a break-in technique, but I was hoping you guys would pick up on that. So you passed my, my test. Very good. I, I don't like this just for the fact of it's stuck under all of these instruments. I don't like that at all. Uh, the, I'm going to go grab it in a hurry, or a surgeon's going to grab it in a hurry, and all of those instruments are going to go flying in different directions. That's my fear. I don't like stacking things on top of other things, just because surgeons just see the handle, and they go to pull it, and the next thing you know, like, half of it's on the floor. So it's another, it's not a break-in technique, but it's just a preference. All right, let's see. I think that's what I wanted to point out with that. What about this one? You see anything going on here? There's a white sponge that's hanging off down to the left of the table. It's actually over and down, going down below. Yes, the tail of that lap sponge is definitely not good. And the cord, yeah. And the cord. Mm-hmm, and the cord. So if you were scrubbed in and this was what you had, what would you do to correct the matter? Burn it all. Burn it. <laughs> Gasoline and a torch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Other thoughts? I do like the burn it thought. Uh, restart uh, or at least replace those two items. Replace those two items, definitely. Um, so how are you going to do that? Let's see. Let me see. Ian has something. Aseptically remove them from the stand. Have the circulator get new ones. Yes! Is absolutely right. Yep. So where, okay, so let me ask you, if you, how are you going to remove this aseptically? Pull down and away. Is there a special place that you would grab it? Would you grab it here? Or would you grab it up here? Or would you, what, what, can you touch it? I would grab it from the non-contaminated area um, because that place hasn't been contaminated just yet. So grab it from there and then pull it away to where it's the, towards me where um, I can't contaminate the rest of the field. I like it. Up and away, up, up and away, up, up and away. Yes, so there's something else we have to think about here. Um, one of those things is this is the Bovi pencil, right? And what's attached to it? Anybody remember when we were in the lab and we were working with the Bovi pencil? The tip. And do we count the tip? Yes, and is it considered a sharp? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, it is. So if you have already counted, this little tip is added to your count. So when you pass that off, you're gonna pass that tip off too. And so the count has to be amended, right? So one bovie tip is going off and you and your circulator can decide, you know, they're probably gonna pull it off and put it in the sharps and they're gonna give you another one and you're gonna count that bovie tip and it'll just stay the same. But that communication has to happen, right? Okay, I'm passing this bovie off, it has a bovie tip. Okay, I'll get you a new one. Okay, they get it. Okay, I have a bovie tip. Okay, we're good, we stayed the same. We got rid of one and we replaced it with another one. All right, same with the sponge. The sponges are counted as well. Okay, so you can't just pull these off and throw them in the trash can. Okay, they have to stay in the room because they're, they're part of the count. Unless the nurse is gonna bag them up in a trash bag and take them all the way out of the operating room and dispose of them somewhere else. And then you could start over and get more, right? But if you get rid of these because they're counted, we have to you know, treat them special, not like if you were just gonna throw off the medicine cup or the marking pin or something like that, which goes in the trash, circulator gets another one, right? But if it's part of a count, then there's something else we have to do. Does that make sense? Beautiful, the red box. Um, that's where you get movies, isn't it, red box? Okay, um, this is actually for um, sharps. Mm-hmm, yep. So Tammy and Alyssa, you're asking about the same thing. This is a, a sharps box, this little thing right here. This is a magnetic side, and this is a foamy side, okay? And as you use blades, needles, bobby tips, whatever, stick them in here, all right? If you're using several needles, then the first one, you could stick in the one, and the next one in the two, and the next one in the three, and so on and so forth. So when you get ready to count your needles, it's like one, two, three, four, five. Really easy, right? So this is a way to help you keep track of your sharps and a place to put them to keep them safe. So this is where they always need to go so they're not running amok. You can put your bovie tip in here when you're done, your hypodermic needles, all of that shenanigans, and then it actually does lock. So it folds in half like a little, like a little book. Um, and you will fold it and lock it and then dump it in your sharps container. Except for in the lab, we keep them and reuse them for all eternity. Okay, good question. This doesn't have a label, but we're not talking about things that don't have labels. We're just looking at sterile technique. You're welcome. Um, that's it. That's all I have for our review. Questions about any of these principles that we've gone over? Anything, anything? Ready to get in the lab and practice? I'm excited to do that. Okay, now comes the test. 
Don't worry, it's not graded. Let's see, I gotta figure out where I need to go. Let's see if this works. Um, let's see, Quizlet. Okay, I created this little test for us, like a little practice quiz. It's got some questions here. Starts off with some matchings. So we have eight matching questions where we're going to match the situation with the principal. So some, app, some more application of our concepts. So the first one we have is storage of sterile packages and drapes. Storage of them. I don't know that we've gone over storage of them. Let's see if we can figure out which one of these would match. What would make sense? Any ideas? You want me to take it for you guys? Yeah, E. I forgot to scroll. It's my fault. I'm pretty sure it's E. Okay. Oh, so we want to place them on a smooth, dry, clean surface to prevent damage and, and of the packaging material. All right, what about two? Destruction of integrity of microbial barrier. F, 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 F. Oh, somebody says G. C. Which one, Rulan? I say C. You say C? Yeah. Destruction of integrity of microbial barrier. Let's see. I'm getting a consensus of G. So we're going to go with G. So we'll grade this at the end. Okay. What next? Create sterile field as close to time of use as possible. I'm seeing A. Okay. Consensus of A. Good, okay, moving along. Chemical indicators for, or check chemical indicators for exposure. C, 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 okay. Five, never cover the sterile field with a sterile drape and move to another OR. Alyssa says B, Ian says B, okay. I'm seeing lots of Bs. All right, moving along. Number six, sterile packages found in storage areas used for non-sterile items. We're done with A, B, and C, so I'm going to move up. Oh, H I'm seeing. Okay. What about seven? Opening a sterile wrapped package. D, our first flap goes away, last flap comes towards us. Okay, and by process of elimination, does F make sense? Separate setup should be used for clean contaminated procedures. Liking it, yes. Yes, indeed. All right, now some multiple choices. Should be stored on their sides to prevent pressure that can rupture the seal sides and violate the integrity of the packaging. We haven't gone over this one yet, but maybe Rulon can help us out because this is an SPD thing. Yes, Rulon is helping us out. He says peel packs, and that is true. When we cook them, we want to put the peel packs on their sides, not lay them on their backs, uh, paper backs, or plastic fronts. All right. Uh, is considered sterile except for one inch perimeter around the outside edge. Number two, are you saying this one? I'm going to say the inside of paper or... Rulon, you're saying inside of paper wrappers? They mean pill packs, paper wrappers? Inside of paper wrappers? 
Rulon is saying inside of paper wrappers. I see others saying two. Rainy, you agree with Rulon? And Alexis agrees with Rulon. And they say paper wrappers. Do they mean pill packs or? I think barrel? they mean like ChemGuard wraps, right? Paper wraps. Oh, okay. What do you guys think? <laughs> B or C? Somebody else chime in. Jackie says B. Okay, it looks like our, our majority is B from the answers I'm getting. So then we're going to go with that. Only the top is considered sterile. B, bees, 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 draped tables. Okay. Uh, used to hold draping material and any cords and tubing, such as the suction tubing and bovie cord. Do you guys remember back from lab what we used? I'm getting A, I'm getting A, very good. All righty. If in a pervious wrapper considered contaminated, if wrapper is impervious and floor was dry, it can be transferred to sterile field, but must not be returned to sterile storage. If in the previous wrapper. I couldn't hear you, Rulon. I'm sorry. Alyssa says B. Is that what you were saying to Rulon? Oh, you were rereading. Okay, cool. Anybody else say B or something else? Okay, I've got some agrees. Okay, um, number six, do not reposition. No reposition. Okay, I'm seeing Ds. Forces air out and allows air to be pulled inward. What do you think causes that? Rainy says D, Alyssa says B. Somebody else chime in, help us out. Majority vote, let your voice be heard. Oh boy, I got D, B, D, B, B, D. Okay, I think I still need a tiebreaker. <laughs> B, D, B, B, D, B. Okay, so we're gonna go with B. Flip coin, any, 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 all. Okay, B. Okay, we'll figure it out in the end. Once placed, tips are considered unsterile and should be left in place until the end of the procedure. Oh, we're very fast with that, Tori. Anybody agree with Tori? Nice. Excelente. Okay, a couple true or false. Uh, when in doubt, throw it out. True or false? Yes, that's my favorite one. All right, what about number two? Isolate the skin knife to prevent further use on deep tissue. Never cover the sterile field with a sterile drape and move to another. Are those true? Those are true. Okay. Look for evidence of strike through, tears, holes, puncture, watermarks. Check chemical indicators and expiration dates. I don't know about the non perforating towel clips. I'm not sure what it's doing here. Just seems weird. Check chemical indicators and expiration date. Though I'm not sure that those two go together. Seems weird. What do you guys think?
I think the first two go together. Non, well, non-perforating, they do not perforate the drape, so they would technically be considered sterile. Perforating towel clips would be contaminated. But it seems like it's connecting things together weirdly. What do you guys want to pick? Help me out. We got to take a break and take do a kahoot. Okay, Tori is saying true, Ian says true. Okay, let's go with true. How about contents must never be allowed to slide over the edge when opening item onto the sterile field? Heat sealed pack. Do those things line up? Yes? Is that one true? Two? It's two, it's two. Okay. Anything extending below is considered non sterile and table edge. Two. Okay, a couple more. Strike through has occurred. The drape is contaminated and must be replaced with a new drape. And opening a sterile wrapped package. Do those two things go together? Strike through. The drape is contaminated, must be replaced with a new drape, and then opening sterile package. I got a T, I got an F. I need confirmation, I got another F. Okay, we're gonna go with majority. We'll circle back as long as I'm not signed out. Remember when we did the other one and I was signed out and I was mad. Okay, um, sterile transfer handles may be used and opening a sterile wrapped package. Do those two line up? Maybe no true false next time. They're kind of strange. We're saying true. Okay, I see a couple trues. Anybody else wanna chime in? Yeah, putting them together is weird, I agree. It is, okay, we're just gonna go for true. We're gonna check our answers. Okay, so all of our matching, we did good. You are matching, oh, this one here. is considered sterile except for a one inch perimeter. That's gonna be inside of our wrappers. Remember, uh, like um, when we opened the gown on the mayo stand, we want that one inch perimeter inside the wrap. That's what it's talking about there. Does that make sense? Um, let's see what else. This one here. Forces air out and allows air to be pulled inward. So this is what happens when we drop something. When we drop a package, it's going to force air out and then as it expands again, right, air is going to come back in because it's just made out of paper, right? Well, paper and plastic, but that paper part um, is going to force air out. And so if we drop something on the floor, um, if we don't use it right away during that case, we don't want to put it back in sterile storage because it's been on the floor. All right, and then our weird true and false ones. Um, this one's false. It should be instruments that come into contact with the patient's skin should not be reused. So this one doesn't match with it. So it should be isolate the skin knife and instruments that come into contact with the patient's skin should not be reused in deep tissue. These true and false ones were kind of weird. Uh, this one here should be um, check for integrity. So looking for evidence of strike through tears, holes, punctured watermarks, checking the chemical indicator and expiration date, that doesn't match with the, the towel clips. It matches with checking with, for integrity. Does that make sense? Because we do all of these things is considered checking for integrity. All right, and then this last one, this sterile transfer handles has to do with the immediate use steam sterilizer. So they there's a special little pan that they can cook the stuff in. There's a handle that stays not sterile and that pan has like a little hook that will receive the handle so that your circulator can bring it to you and you can 
fish it out. But we, didn't, we haven't really talked about that though. All right, that is it. That is a good review of our principles. Questions about any of those before I give you a break. There's this really cool thing that Quizlet does. It's called Quizlet Live, and it allows you to like play as a team. Um, I might try, I don't know if we can do it as like an entire class, but I might, we might play with that at some point. Um, because breaking up into groups is gonna be too hard because I won't know what groups Quizlet breaks you up into, but as one big group, maybe we can do it, I don't know. Okay, um, no questions. Let's take another 10 minute break. So at about 10 after, if you can be back and then joined in to our cahoots, okay? All right, awesome blossoms.